Hello, my name is Mark Sheets. I direct the Pharmacometric Center of Excellence at Midwestern University and practice clinically at Northwestern Medicine as an infectious diseases pharmacist. I want to thank Lab Roots today for the opportunity to talk to you, um, to talk about a, a subject I'm very passionate about, and it's really trying to make vancomycin safer for our patients. So today we'll talk about vancomycin, how the urinary biomarkers and precision dosing um, might really fulfill this hope of precision medicine um, for what is the currently the, the most frequently utilized antibiotic in the hospital setting. Uh, the objectives for today's talk are to describe the exposure response relationships that exist for vancomycin. Let me just set my timer here. Uh, that exists for vancomycin and discuss kidney injury. Um, we will also talk about some of these newer biomarkers that may prove useful in the clinical setting and uh, really how we might eventually start to apply these biomarkers to make dosing safer for our patients. So vancomycin, why are we talking about vancomycin? This is an antibiotic that was approved in 1958. So by antibiotic standards, this is one of our older antibiotics it is a tricyclic glycosylated peptide antibiotic, and um, it was isolated in the jungles of Borneo. Uh, came from a soil sample that uh, Eli Lilly had sent scientists out to collect these soil samples and really try to find some fermented products that were active against pathogens at the time. And it was very highly active against gram-positive pathogens. It had activity against uh, almost all staphylococcal pathogens, and uh, the name vancomycin was actually for vanquish. It was able to vanquish just about every staphylococcal pathogen that they could find, and it has activity against some enterococcal species as well. Now, this antibiotic binds to the dialadialanine cell wall precursor, and that in turn prevents bacterial cell wall synthesis. So this is what we call a, a slowly sidle antibiotic, um, by inhibiting the cell wall, um, it, it uh, is able to kill these bacteria slowly over time. And today, vancomycin really is the most frequently utilized antibiotic in the hospital setting. Um, if uh, you look at the numbers, there's probably over 3 million people that receive vancomycin annually, and that's in the United States alone. So this is an antibiotic that is seeing quite a bit of use and many of our patients are receiving it. Therefore, uh, in addition to making sure that it's an efficacious medication, we should also make sure that it is uh, being delivered in as safe of a manner as possible. When we talk about vancomycin, we talk about um, a couple major toxicities. Now, the older data um, really had, had found that there was some ototoxicity and some neurotoxicity associated with vancomycin. In today's practice, um, it is possible for that to occur, but uh, we usually see much less of that at the within the therapeutic window of, of vancomycin today. Essentially, how much vancomycin we're giving today, we see much less ototoxicity and neurotoxicity. We're going to spend most of our time today talking about nephrotoxicity, and that's because nephrotoxicity is a very common event uh, for patients that receive vancomycin. Acute, acute kidney injury is um, a major concern these days, and the reason is because in um, many hospitalized patients, especially among the critically ill, it's a common occurrence and it can lead to prolonged morbidity and mortality. So uh, what happens in the hospital has very long uh, effects for the patient um, whether or not they leave the hospital, and if they leave the hospital, their quality of life after, after leaving. Vancomycin has an approximate attributable rate of about 10% of acute kidney injury compared to other active antimicrobials against gram-positive agents, and I will show you some of that data. So let's first and start by taking a bit of a historic view. If we look at vancomycin over the years, this is a 
PubMed search that was conducted between the years uh, 1977 and truncated at the end of last year, so at the end of 2019. And if we look just for the report of vancomycin and kidney injury, we can see that um, between 1977 and 2019, it was relatively flat up until a period of time. And that period of time probably corresponds um, with when the pneumonia guidelines came out. In 2005, the pneumonia guidelines came out and recommended that um, for some of our hospital-acquired pneumonias, we might consider increasing the vancomycin exposures such that the minimal concentration, the trough concentrations, would range between uh, 15 and 20 micrograms per mil. In 2009, the vancomycin guidelines came out and these were the first guidelines to um, address uh, how we should be dosing vancomycin for a variety of infections. And you can already see that there was an uptick in kidney injury by that time. So the pneumonia guidelines probably set the wheel in motion and the vancomycin guidelines um, really sort of reciprocated that uh, perhaps we might want to increase the exposures for vancomycin. And you can see that uh, either by publication bias or by real event, we started to note much more kidney injury in the literature that was deemed associated with vancomycin. Now, these data were only up until 1977, so I'll show you some of the earlier data before that. So vancomycin, again, um, was FDA approved in 1958. And it was very quickly shelved. And the reason it was very quickly shelved is because this was a fermentation product. And uh, when it initially came out, Eli Lilly uh, was asked to bring it to market very, very quickly. And they did so. And the reason they did so was because uh, there were really no other antibiotics at the time that had this type of activity against Staphylococcus aureus. And it was a very messy product. It was a very dirty product. You can see on the far left picture there, um, it, it really was not a clean and purified product. Over time, they were able to purify the product. But um, what happened was that methicillin came out and the other antistaphylococcal penicillins came out shortly after vancomycin. And vancomycin was shelved because it was the more toxic of the antibiotics. And I'll show you uh, when the uptake um, happened again. So when vancomycin first came out, so in the 1950s and early 1960s, we saw this pyrogen reaction. Uh, these were thought to be reactions that were secondary to the unpurified product. And some of these very early studies were excellent. Um, you can see in, in 1962, there was a report that in, in patients with azotemia or renal insufficiency, vancomycin, vancomycin should be used with caution and that therapy should be guided by repeated serum assays. So back in 1962, they were really promoting the use of vancomycin very similar to the way that uh, it's being promoted today. They said that if patients were young and healthy, um, they did not think that you would have to do assays to monitor the concentrations of vancomycin, except in unusual circumstances. And this early product caused a bunch of phlebitis and a bunch of nephrotoxicity, but it was all thought really to be due to the impurities. As time progressed and um, we started to see methicillin resistance, then vancomycin uh, use started to occur much more frequently. It, was the, it became the drug of choice for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And by the time that this happened, around the 1980s, vancomycin was um, a, a very pure and pyrogen-free product. Nephrotoxicity was um, occurring in approximately about 5% of patients. Um, however, if you gave concomitant nephrotoxins, that rate could go up by 30% to about 35%. So really, people viewed vancomycin as a product that was really safe from a kidney perspective. There were early animal studies, such as this rat study, where they gave up to 400 milligrams per kilogram, which is an allometrically scaled dose um, that um, is uh, 
a, a little bit higher than what we would give our patients um, on a regular basis uh, today. And they found absolutely no kidney damage with this. Now, um, later when they um, performed necropsy, they were able to find that um, much of the vancomycin was probably, um, uh, had probably crystallized um, within the intraperitoneal injection, sorry, the, the subcutaneous injection. So a lot of the vancomycin was not absorbed. So some of these, some of these studies um, that happened very early that found very little renal toxicity um, may be confounded by the fact that the dose was just not absorbed. Um, there is some dog data that was able to show that um, in dogs, if you had given them um, uh, a high dose, they, uh, they did end up in, in renal failure. And uh, when rats were given doses, uh, um, vancomycin and means other than subcutaneous injection, they also saw nephrotoxicity. And that almost brings us up to the present day. In 2009, those vancomycin guidelines came out and they recommended that uh, vancomycin um, uh, should be monitored for patients receiving uh, prolonged therapy and that um, for, for serious infections, patients could receive uh, exposures that uh, resulted in troughs between 15 and 20 milligrams per liter, that's micrograms per milliliter. And if patients had more than two consecutive instances of serum creatinine, over 50% increase from baseline, they would call that nephrotoxicity. So the new guidelines ask clinicians to start dosing patients with higher exposures of vancomycin, but it also realized that they didn't know what would happen from a nephrotoxicity standpoint, and they created a definition for nephrotoxicity um, and asked uh, clinicians and researchers to use that when considering whether or not a patient became nephrotoxic. And after those guidelines came out, um, many studies were able to show a dose toxicity response relationship. That is, when patients achieve trough concentrations less than 10, they had much lower nephrotoxicity than when they achieved concentrations that exceeded 20 milligrams per liter. Now, it was important that these studies also were finding that uh, patients that had received trough concentrations between 15 and 20 in retrospective analysis um, were performing better from an efficacy standpoint. That is, the higher dose of vancomycin, while it was more nephrotoxic and causing more kidney injury, also was more efficacious. But it was notable that we were seeing more nephrotoxicity. Uh, over time, we've developed uh, a good number of classification schemes for uh, kidney injury. Um, some of the most commonly used today are the AKIN, uh, the RIFLE, and the KDGO classification schemes. Um, the ones that are being used most frequently today um, generally use a serum creatinine rise of one and a half times baseline. That's shown in stage one for AKIN uh, and KDGO and that is or uh, a 0.3 milligram per deciliter increase in serum creatinine. And we'll show you uh, some data about why that number is used as opposed to uh, the number of 0.5 or 50% increase from the vancomycin guidelines. We really did not have many prospective studies with vancomycin where you could clearly compare vancomycin use um, to a relevant comparator and assess nephrotoxicity. In 2012, Richard Wonderink, uh, one of my colleagues at Northwestern, published this paper in Clinical Infectious Diseases. This study, the Zephyr study, took five and a half years to complete. They randomized uh, over 1,200 patients to get under 400 patients a valuable in the per, per protocol analysis. Now, the groups were relatively similar, and we could spend the better part of a half an hour discussing this study alone. 
But important in this study, it was a randomized study, and they allowed pharmacists to adjust the doses of vancomycin to desired trough concentrations. In this study, they saw a nephrotoxicity rate of 18.2% for vancomycin patients and about 8.4% for linazolid patients. In my mind, this is some of the best evidence of the attributable rate of vancomycin toxicity because it comes from a prospective study. Now, the rates are going to vary considerably based on um, a patient's comorbidities, um, but this gives us a pretty, good, a, a pretty good estimate of what nephrotoxicity might look like in, in a comparative analysis of infected patients. Now, prior to 2009, it was thought that vancomycin caused nephrotoxicity primarily through uh, an interstitial nephritis mechanism. So more of an allergic type picture um, causing, causing kidney injury. And this was really a rare event and an event that was very difficult to predict, that some patients just seem to have this more allergic picture to vancomycin. Um, as the doses started to become increased, it became uh, increasingly recognized that higher doses caused acute tubular necrosis with vancomycin, and this was indeed dose responsive. I still remember uh, the day I received a call from one of my nephrology colleagues, and she said, Mark, I have, a, I have a case series of people that have acute tubular necrosis from vancomycin, and I, I said, I don't know if I believe that. Vancomycin causes acute interstitial nephritis, and it really isn't uh, very much of a nephrotoxin. Well, uh, over time, we've now found that vancomycin really does cause acute tubular necrosis, that is the dose responsive mechanism for toxicity. And uh, that model is, uh, can be recapitulated in the animals. So in a rat model, we have also seen that as you increase the dose of vancomycin, you do indeed get uh, proximal tubule necrosis um, that uh, is verifiable on histopathology. So we can see that it's actually quite a bit more complex when we look at it from a cellular level. Um, on the far left, we can see uh, acute interstitial nephritis demonstrated in this cartoon that was put together by Dr. Gwen Pace from our group, and I think she did a very nice job with this. And acute interstitial nephritis, we can see the T cells and dendritic cells causing inflammation leading to cellular toxicity. The two cells on the right represent acute tubular necrosis and the downstream, um, the downstream occurrences from oxidative stress, which we can see are quite complex, as well as cast formation, which also can lead to cellular injury. And the question that we have to ask clinically is, well, can we detect this cellular injury before it actually leads to problems for the patient? So are we able to determine in advance when a patient has uh, suffered a cellular injury, um, but before it becomes more of a functional change. Um, and I'll show you some of these uh, novel biomarkers, some of the newer biomarkers where this might be the case. Our traditional biomarkers, such as blood urea, nitrogen, and serum creatinine, usually um, start to elevate after there already is considerable damage. And then finally, when we see things such as protein in the urine and high blood pressure, um, there is already quite a bit of damage. And now there's quite a bit of interest in these kidney biomarkers. The Predictive Safety Testing Consortium Working Group has started to look at a large number of these biomarkers and start to think about them relative to um, the location of the nephron and uh, the different types of injuries that might occur. When we think about ideal biomarkers, we think about biomarkers that uh, will indeed show a relationship with actual toxicity. We think about biomarkers that can be identified early before um, uh, too much toxicity happens. We'd like to see biomarkers that are specific to kid the kidney. Uh, we'd like to see biomarkers that can show a gradation of injury over time and then later show recovery from kidney injury. And um, over time, we would like to know uh, the various limitations of these and, and characterize them. Finally, we want biomarkers that are easy to obtain. 
it's not very helpful if we have to give our patients kidney biopsies in order to determine if there is kidney injury. Now, serum creatinine has been one of the most commonly used biomarkers, and it's, it's a good marker of injury as well as function. However, it is very slow to react. And it's slow to react uh, and differs based on uh, the amount of baseline injury that a patient has. So based on a patient's uh, stage of kidney disease, um, these are the values. Uh, this is the amount of time it takes, uh, the, red, the red squares, the amount of time it takes for creatinine to double. And so we see that it is very difficult for the clinician to predict what our serum creatinines are indeed telling from us, telling for us. Um, and you add that with a high interpatient variability, and it makes it very difficult to create population models. Over time, we're going to start talking, I think, about biomarkers that can help tell us and help differentiate between kidney injury and kidney function. Um, serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen are good, to good about telling us about kidney injury, and they also can be good about telling us about function. However, we've already talked about the fact that they are a little bit slow to react. Other, other markers such as urine output um, are commonly used. I think we're gonna to start to see some of our newer biomarkers, uh, things such as kidney injury molecule one, clusterin, osteopontin, and NGAL being used to define early injury. However, these are not yet FDA approved. They've been FDA qualified for preclinical study, but they are not yet FDA approved. There is one FDA approved urinary biomarker, that's TIMP2 IGFBP7, and that goes by the trade name of Nephrocheck. Unfortunately, we haven't seen too many drug studies yet to know how drug-induced kidney injury um, is detectable with this biomarker. Now, over time, I think we're going to start to see better, better markers of function as well. Those would include better surrogates for glomerular filtration rate. Um, right now, the most commonly used is to estimate our GFRs with serum creatinine. However, we may start to see more use of cystatin C, which is uh, one of the newer biomarkers. And we uh, may start to see some of these more research type methods um, as they become more and more palatable um, in that you can indeed look at a real time uh, glomerular filtration rate. Here's just a very quick sample from our laboratory. Uh, these were rats that received sinistrin uh, fit C, and they were monitored with this device um, to record the clearance of that sinistrin. Um, this certainly is not approved for clinical use yet, but I do think over time we will see more and more uh, clinical products start to reach the market where our clinicians will be able to know what a patient's GFR is in real time by giving uh, a more exogenous substance instead of relying on endogenous substances such as serum creatinine. Now, why are we so interested in these biomarkers? The reason is that uh, they tend to be very sensitive and very specific for kidney injury. Um, some of the early preclinical data with uh, kidney injury molecule one shows that if you clamp the renal pedicle in a rat, uh, you see a very clear and clean uh, response from the kidney injury molecule one, as opposed to when we look at our traditional biomarkers, such as blood urea, nitrogen, and serum creatinine. Now, when we start talking about how this might work its way into clinical care and the dosing of vancomycin, we can start to think about all of those different biomarkers and what they represent in terms of uh, kidney structures and what might be injured. Now, the various biomarkers uh, can be specific for various uh, nephron structures. For instance, kidney injury molecule one is very highly specific for uh, the renal proximal tubule. And we know that is where vancomycin causes its damage. Uh, our group has shown with immunohistochemistry as well as urinary biomarkers that kidney injury molecule one is the best biomarker for predicting uh, renal injury due solely to vancomycin in a rat model. 
Now, this is still a long way from clinical care, but um, we do think that in the in the not so distant future, we will be able to monitor some of these biomarkers and determine if uh, patients are suffering renal insults specific to the exact type of drug that they are receiving. And hopefully over time, we're going to be able to fold all of this together. There's a field of study that's been called pharmacometrics, and this field of stu study essentially can be distilled down to uh, what people used to call the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic relationships of a drug. Pharmacodynamics is um, essentially what happens after you give the drug, and um, that can fall into the two buckets of efficacy and toxicity. And pharmacometrics essentially is the math that describes all of those relationships together. So over time, we would like to start to create relationships and or understand the relationships by which we can measure drug concentrations, control those drug concentrations, and understand the threshold for uh, both reaching toxicity and uh, the thresholds for uh, reaching efficacy and preventing toxicity. And this can be done in our preclinical models by assaying the drug shown in figure A is uh, simply um, an LCMS assay. We can then create pharmacokinetic models in um, panels B and C and fit those models such that they're specific to the individual. Once we're able to estimate or clearly measure the exposures for each of those animals, we can then start to think about how those exposures relate to injury. And some of our initial studies demonstrated that uh, KIM-1, clustering and osteopontin were the best biomarkers for identifying vancomycin-induced kidney injury, and we can create, uh, we, can, we can fit and find the mathematic relationships that are associated with pharmacokinetic parameters. In this case, we're looking at area under the concentration curve, the maximal concentration, and the minimum concentration when moving left to right. We don't need a lot of math to see that uh, the, uh, the panels on the far left are much better fit than those are in the middle and those are on the far right. In our first models, we can see that the area under the concentration curve is what most clearly describes kidney injury as defined by kidney injury molecule one in the rat model. Now on those previous slides, we saw that it was a little bit difficult to tease out whether it was area under the concentration curve or the maximal concentration that was actually driving the toxicity. So to help answer this question, we decided to complete a dose fractionation study. And this was done by Dr. Sean Avedesian who was with our lab at the time and is now an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska. And you can see in panel A, he was very successful in creating this fractionation scheme and fitting his pharmacokinetic model. And in panel B, this obviously led to uh, the maximal concentrations being well separated. That when you give the drug four times daily with the same daily total amount, you get a lower C max in that group than when you give it as a single daily dose. Now, interestingly, what he found was that as we increased the fractionation and as the C max went down uh, for essentially similar AUCs, we got lower kidney injury uh, as demonstrated and measured by Kim one in our rat model. From there, uh, we're able to fit relationships again, so fit some of these mathematic relationships and look at um, dose response curves. We can see that both for AUC and for Cmax, uh, there are very good curves that are fit and they uh, correspond with uh, increases in kidney injury molecule one. We also see that um, as we look at all of the Kim one in the furthest panel to the right, that third panel to the right, that as the drug was given in a more fractionated fashion, we also see lower kidney injury. 
So this suggests that we might be able to get less kidney injury by giving the drug more frequently, even for the same total daily dose. Now the human studies um, so far have focused mostly on area under the concentration curve. Um, we now know that trough is both imprecise um, for, um, for determining pharmacokinetic models and understanding a human's exposure to vancomycin, as well as in the animal model, it is very clearly not the correct pharmacokinetic parameter for looking at toxicity. Um, there were a number of studies that have been done that have looked at how area under the concentration curve relates with vancomycin toxicity. And um, Dr. Doa Al Jeffrey was able to look at this in a meta analysis. She found that the the point at which toxicity, the point at which toxicity was increased was around uh, an AUC of about 650. And uh, this analysis was limited by the total number of studies that were done and the manner in which the, the data could be compiled. However, uh, we did start to see that uh, even within the therapeutic range, the previous therapeutic range, um, we were starting to see that it might be prudent to lower AUCs for our patients to not incur excess toxicity. A study performed by Dr. Tom Lodis, the PROVIDE study, um, implemented a desirability outcome analysis. And if we focus on the red bars here, um, those are what we would consider to be the best possible outcome. And so those red bars are that the patient survives and the treatment is a success and they do not have acute kidney injury. We can see that the red bars are really quite similar for uh, the two groups that are shown on the left. That's an AUC between 94 and 387, and an AUC of 392 to 515. However, there appeared to be a pretty clean break after we got above that, that grouping of 515, and our patients tended to do less well. We started to get more kidney injury. So the pink bars are what are shown as the patient survived, there was treatment success, however, there was acute kidney injury. This study and others are being used to suggest that the upper limit for AUCs should be somewhere around this range, somewhere in the 515 to around 600 range. So these are not exact numbers at this point, but we are starting to see that there is some threshold that we will be able to figure out over time. Now, our group has been interested in trying to figure out how all of this links up. And the reason is because in order to enroll a patient into a clinical trial, it costs about $40,000 to enroll that patient in a clinical trial. And we need many, many patients to be randomized in order to detect differences. So this makes doing these clinical trials very expensive and impractical. And uh, furthermore, um, oftentimes the clinical trials that are completed are not able to focus on important subgroups. For instance, what happens to a patient with diabetes? So our group has been working on linking up um, what we know about the outcomes for humans and the outcomes for rat, and we're trying to create a model by which uh, the rat will predict humans. So far, we've had some success, and we hope to present these data at the uh, upcoming ECMID conference. Um, but what we can see is that the rat model is highly reproducible, and um, it is simply shifted to the right of that for the human. That is very similar to allometric scaling. Um, the rat requires um, a predictable amount more than the human to cause that nephrotoxicity. And that predictable amount um, being mathematically replicatable is important for future studies. Ultimately, we can put this into uh, more complex pharmacokinetic models and really start to figure out what's going on with biomarkers. And those are biomarkers that we can obtain um, in, in the box four down there, that is within the urine. And <clears throat> we can very carefully understand the amount that we give our preclinical models, um, model the pharmacokinetic exposures, and then model toxicity. And where I think this will go in the very near future is in addition to measuring injury um, with things such as urinary biomarkers, I think that we will be able to look at 
real-time glomerular function with um, methodologies such as that that I showed you earlier with Sinistrin. Now, there are brand new guidelines that are coming out. They should probably be out within the next month or so. And those guidelines are expected to say that First, we should assume that all Staphylococcus aureus MICs are one, unless we very clearly know them to be higher. And that if you're treating Staphylococcus aureus in a serious infection, and most Staphylococcus aureus infections are serious, that you should maintain your vancomycin AUCs between 400 and 600 milligrams per liter. Now, I think we're gonna find that this number will change a little bit over time. And this is the first that they have set an area under the con uh, and an AUC an area under the concentration curve target for vancomycin. We will get more precise over time, and I think we probably will learn that uh, at that upper range we will see excess toxicity and perhaps uh, uh, no additional efficacy benefit. But those studies will need to be completed. And then what the clinicians really want to know is after all of this is said and done. Can we be more precise for our patients so they do not end up with a bad outcome? So they, we can get them to efficacy without getting to nephrotoxicity. And we're able to, um, uh, with, with better mathematical models these days, um, we're able to create precision dosing. Uh, this was a slide that um, was uh, given to me by Dr. Michael Neely from the Laboratory of Applied Pharmacokinetics and Bioinformatics. And um, his lab has been uh, field leaders in generating software that help us understand ways to individualize doses for patients. Now we can use Bayesian priors, that is all the information that is known about uh, uh, interpatient variability and intrapatient variability and sparse sampling to best understand what sort of concentration profile a patient may obtain with even sparse sampling. And I think we'll start to see these type of programs make it into computer systems in the very near future. Um, you will not need to understand all of the math behind uh, these computer programs, I don't think. I think that in the very near future, we will uh, be able to have these things available in very graphical format that is very understandable to uh, our clinicians that spend, um, rightly so, the vast majority of their time treating their patients. And I think we're going to start to see that precision dosing really is a subset of precision medicine. Precision medicine has previously been defined mostly as genomics, but, but precision dosing really is the precision medicine that was occurring before genomics. There is much variability in the doses and exposures that our patients receive, and we still uh, do not know nearly as much as we should about how those exposure response relationships manifest. So I think it's an exciting time for our clinicians. There's a lot of information coming out, and we're very quickly um, putting the tools that clinicians need into their hands in order to control the exposures of those medications for their patients. I'm always very thankful for our, our excellent group. Um, a lot of the work that I showed you today uh, has been supported by uh, the NIH, NIAID, and we have other ongoing studies, um, but it really is the people that um, permit all of this work to be completed. So many thanks to the uh, PhDs and the postdocs in the lab and our clinical partners at Northwestern. And so that concludes our talk today. I really appreciate the time and the opportunity to speak with you about how I think that urinary biomarkers and precision dosing really are going to change the way that we're treating patients in the future. Thank you so much.